In this video we're going to look at an introduction to probability for the statistics course. Now this is going to whiz through a few topics assuming that you have been introduced to these before via GCSE Maths and we'll spend a little bit more time on those topics which are new to you. So let's start off with a probability line. As you can see for our first learning objective we need to make sure that we know the basic meanings of words on a probability scale. So we've got an impossible event, if that was a number it would be zero, and we've got a certain event, if that was a number it would be one, definitely going to happen, an even chance, and then you'd have unlikely, unlikely, and you could also have things like very likely, and things like possible. Okay, so there's a few different words you could have. Right. The majority of the time, though, you're going to be asked for probabilities in numbers, numerically. Now, this could be a fraction or percentage or a decimal. And in fact, unless they specify, you can choose what you give your answer in. And because you're using a calculator, it's very easy to use any of these um, types of numbers. So you wouldn't give it like this, a one in six chance, but you could give it as a one sixth chance and likewise for these counters if I guess we're trying to find the probability of a blue counter here the probability of blue counter would be four out of five now with one sixth that isn't a nice de um, decimal so I'd keep that as a fraction but if you wanted to convert four fifths to 0 0.8 that's absolutely fine either of those would be brilliant the only reason I would say not to for a sixth is it's a recurring decimal and so it loses accuracy if you round it, so you're better off keeping it as a fraction um, for those. Okay, we're going to look a bit about notation as well, and we'll use two-way tables just as a recap. Please excuse the American spelling of favourite, a favourite sport. Okay, so let's just ensure that we not only know how to read a two-way table, but know how we could write this. Let's say we were asked to find... So if we're going to look first of all at the probability that someone picked at random is male, we've got all of these people, okay? So we're going to have to find the total number of males first. Well, that's how many males we have. We want the probability they're male. So the probability is the males out of the total. That will be the probability that we'll pick a male. Well, we haven't actually got the total here. We've got the total of each sport type, and we've now got the total males, but we don't have the total females, so we either would have to add up these three, or I could add up the females and add it onto my males. We've got 150 here. It's not very clear if I put it there, so I'm going to put it. Total is 150. So the probability of male is 77 out of 150, and I can leave it as a fraction. But I'm actually going to look a little bit at notation here as well. And so I'm going to say, okay, probability of a male, I can write that as probability of male. So now I know what I'm actually saying with this fraction, probability of male. Okay, what about probability it's a female who likes to watch baseball? So probability female and baseball okay female and baseball is this number here so that's 45 once again out of 150 and I could simplify that but I don't actually need to for probability that is sufficient and last of all is a male who does not like to watch football we, we know there are 77 males and 40 of them do like to watch football, so that must mean that 77 take away 40 is 37 do not. So that would be probability of male not football would be 37 out of 150. I haven't put that as a worked example, but feel free to write any notes of anything you're unsure of. We are going to now look at some worked examples though. Going back to our learning objectives, we've just briefly looked at the first two and we're now going to look at expected frequencies and actual frequencies and we're going to look at an example for that. 
Sometimes this is called experimental probability. And what we're looking at is um, trials. Experiments are called trials. And we're looking at estimated probability. And there is a formula, but rather than doing it in words, if we understand it, in this case, that works a little bit better. So let's look at an example. Nima gives Josh a dice and says Josh will win if he scores more than 10 sixes in 100 rolls of the dice. Um, if the dice is fair, how many sixes would Josh expect to score in 100 rolls of the dice? And then we've got the actual results, which they recorded. And we're going to look at how these compare with what we expect to happen. And this is quite useful for probability. Um, because although rolling a dice 100 times is possible, it's not a super interesting use of our time. But if we're looking at thousands or millions of repetitions or something on a much bigger scale, um, then it's just not feasible to do that. So it's really useful to do predicted, but to understand they don't always match up with what actually happens and sort of discussing why that might be. And this is very useful for the real world in many ways. So we're going to look at um, this dice situation to get our heads around a little bit. If a dice is fair, how many sixes would you expect Josh to score in six in 100 rolls? Well, the probability of getting a six is a sixth. So that's each time. And then he's doing it 100 times. So we're going to do a sixth times 100 which is 16.7. So I'd expect around 16, 17 rolls of the dice. Now that doesn't mean if I do 20 maybe or 14, something like that, that could happen. It is reasonable with a, in a sort of interval. However, let's look at the actual results and see if that would match up for us. So for B, how do these results compare with the expected ones? Well, we expected around 16, 17, and there are actually five. Now that's a lot fewer. And in fact, because each um, score on dice is equally likely, we know each of them should be around 16 or 17. And if you look at the numbers, these ones are kind of around 16, 17, a little bit off, but not really cause for concern. However, here and here is our real cause for concern, particularly if to win a game you need a six, this dice is not going to be a great dice for you. So it's likely to be biased, to be an unfair or loaded dice and not the kind that you'd want to take into any gambling situation. Now, if we're looking at what sort of answers expected in an exam, um, this is the kind of wording that you'd want. OK, so if you take this opportunity to pause the video and to copy and complete this statement. OK, brilliant. I'm assuming you've now done that. Um, a point to notice. If we are looking at um, a fair dice or coin to toss or any um, experiment really, the more the times that you do it, the estimate of the probability gets closer and closer. If you just do an experiment 10 times, it could easily be appearing to be biased when it's not. If you do it a thousand times, um, then it's going to be much closer to the true value. So an experiment it's always worth to improve the experiment, doing it more repetitions, more times, you're going to get a closer and closer estimate. Okay, we've now looked at the first three learning objectives, all of which um, are actually on the GCSE maths, and we're now just going to look at the fourth one around risk. Okay, this is a new topic, but it's not actually that different from any of the other topics we've done so far. We're going to need a couple of formulae, and we're going to need a couple of worked examples, none of which, neither of which are particularly long. So let's look at the idea of risk. It's sort of what you should expect from what you understand about risk. But basically, the risk of an event is the number of trials or experiments in which the event does happen over how many trials or experiments in total. For example, insurance companies use this quite a lot. Using past records, an insurance company assesses the yearly risk of a house in a certain area being flooded. Obviously, it's going to depend where it is and what it's near. But this particular house in this area, during the past 50 years, total number of trials, flooding in that area has occurred twice, number of trials in which that event happens. So over 50 years, it happens twice. So the probability of it flooding, you might think, also known as the risk in this case, so the risk is going to be number of trials in which it happens to 
out of total trials 50, which you could also have as 0 0.04. Basically the same as probability that it floods, 2 out of 50, but in this case it's the risk. Now we're just going to look at another um, example of risk, and this case we're looking at absolute and relative risk. So we're going to look at your definitions, another formula, and then an example. So our first definition, the absolute risk is the probability of an event happening. So in the previous example, the absolute risk of it flooding is 0 0.04. Now we're also going to look at relative risk, and relative is relative to other things. So compared to other things, how many times more likely is this thing going to happen? And once again, this will make more sense in a worked example. We're just going to need the formula to be able to do that. So a formula is that the relative risk for a group is the risk for those who are in the group divided by those who aren't in the group. Let's look at our worked example. OK, so worked example three, a study is carried out into the risk of developing lung cancer for smokers and non-smokers. The results show that the probability that a smoker will develop lung cancer is 20% and the probability that a non-smoker will develop lung cancer is 2%. What is the relative risk of, of developing lung cancer for smokers compared to non-smokers? So relative risk is the risk for those in the group divided by the risk for those not in the group. So the relative risk is 20% divided by 2%. Well, let's do its decimal, 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.02, 20% and 2%, which is 10. That means that the relative risk is 10. So the risk of developing lung cancer if you smoke is 10 times higher than if you don't smoke. So let's write a sentence just to say that to finish off. OK, so make sure you've got all those notes down and that you understand what you need to do and then have a go at the practice questions.